So last time we were talking about Descartes' meditations, and I tried to explain what Descartes' argument was for the separation of mind and body, the argument that mind and body are really distinct substances. And one question that we need to address is what substances are? What is the definition that we can give of substances? Because it's kind of a mysterious notion, and actually philosophers at different times use that idea a bit differently. So some traditional ideas about substances are discussed in um, Jaguan Kim, page 35, in case you want to look into that source as a background source. One definition we can use is a substance is something in which properties inhere. Um, it is what has or maybe instantiates properties. So substances are kind of the, the things, the subjects in which properties, um, attributes, for example, in here. So substances are not things that other things can instantiate, unlike properties. So substances and properties are distinct. That's one, that's one way that you can understand this definition of substance. The substance is the thing that holds properties, but it itself is not a property. So for example, if color is an attribute, then color can't be a substance. You are either one or the other on this view. Another definition of substance we can give is that a substance is something that has the capacity for independent existence. Um, for example, I can exist independently of other objects in the sense that, um, depending on how you understand the idea, I don't need any other objects to exist um, for me to exist. And if you think that that's false, then basically what you're saying is that I am not a substance. So a substance is whatever it is, doesn't need other objects for its existence. So maybe you think that those kinds of substances are uh, microphysical particles, for example. Maybe an individual quark is such that it doesn't depend on anything else for its own existence. In that case, you think quarks are the kinds of things that make up the substantial properties of the world, anything that's not made of quarks, either doesn't exist or is made of a different substance, if that makes sense. So now talking about substance dualism, uh, substance dualism is the view that the mental and the physical are distinct, right? So they're distinct substances. Specifically, dualists hold that there are two substances, hence dualist. <laughs> you can also be someone who thinks there's only one substance. And if you're someone who thinks there's only one substance, then you're a substance monist. Um, so substance monists include people like materialists who think that only material substances exist, um, and idealists who think that only mental substances exist. There are other kinds of monists in the world besides those types of monists, and we will start ex explore some of the other ways of being monists as the semester rolls along. Maybe you can think of some varieties of substance monism that I haven't mentioned that maybe can occur to you. Similarly, you can be someone who thinks that there's more than just two substances. So for example, you can be a substance pluralist. Pluralist is just the word for you think that there's lots of substances. Um, and there are some people who think uh, that there are three substances. Um, but it, it, we don't talk about it that often in contemporary philosophy. Usually we talk about monism, we talk about dualism, and sometimes we talk about pluralism. Um, but I'm sure you can think of ways to think that there are three substances exactly, or four substances exactly. If you think that there are that many number of substances, you often have to justify why you think that there are exactly that number of substances, and no more and no less. Now just as an aside here... Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Is the theory of the four elements a theory on which there are four substances? That sort of depends on how you think the elements are related to each other. Some philosophers thought everything was made of air, or everything was made of water, and certain people, like Empedocles, believed that everything was made of four distinct elements. Fire, air, water, and earth. You might, you might have heard of those. Now, Empedocles' view could probably be called a form of pluralism. The other views might be called forms of monism. It really depends on what you think is explaining the existence of each element. So if you think 
water is the thing that makes up all of the elements, like allegedly Thales believed, then, you know, it's not like you don't have fire, it's just that fire is made of water, unbeknownst to you, um, and so is air, and so is earth, right? In that case, you're not um, a pluralist. Uh, if you're Empedocles, though, you think that fundamentally, the things that make up the world are four distinct elements. If you think those four distinct elements are also distinct substances, then you definitely get a form of pluralism. If those distinct elements, as in modern-day atomic theory, are actually the same type of substance, like that's how we tend to think of atoms, they're really made up of the same kinds of things even though they explain different elements, um, then you have something that counts as a form of monism or possibly is a component of another view that, that includes material objects as part of the things that exist. So today we're going to be treating um, a response to Descartes' argument for dualism by a early modern philosopher named Elizabeth of Bohemia. She was a princess um, who was actually exiled. She had to live in exile for a while from the place she was the princess of. Um, and she got into a long correspondence with Descartes, and it is this correspondence that I've asked you to read. She was a fan of his and read a lot of his work and had some very intelligent objections that she framed as questions. But in the modern day, we would really regard these polite questions more as very devastating objections. So Elizabeth was an intelligent, um, philosophical, inquiring mind in her own right. And I'm delighted to talk about her with you today. So just as a recap, I'm going to read to you a little bit of Descartes' sixth meditation. He says, The mind is not immediately affected by all parts of the body, but only by the brain, or perhaps just by one small part of the brain. Every time this part of the brain is in a given state, it presents the same signals to the mind, even though the other parts of the body may be in a different condition at the time. For example, when the nerves in the foot are set in motion in a violent and unusual manner, this motion, by way of the spinal cord, reaches the inner parts of the brain, and there you gives the mind its signal for having a certain sensation, namely the sensation of a pain occurring in the foot. This stimulates the mind to do its best to get rid of the cause of the pain, which it takes to be harmful to the foot. So basically, a person is the union of a mind and a body, which causally interact, and Descartes is here describing how he conceives of this causal interaction. Elizabeth of Bohemia, also known as Elizabeth of the Palatinate, later Princess Abbess of Hereford Abbey, which she ran um, very pluralistically, was the eldest daughter of Frederick V and Elizabeth Stuart. She was known for being kind, humble, and very intelligent. As abbess, she provided refuge for many Protestants and non-Protestants fleeing persecution. She was really good friends with Descartes, who even dedicated a book to her, and called her the only person who ever really understood his work. Descartes even pleaded for her family before the Queen of Sweden, who he briefly tutored before his death also. Elizabeth never married. However, her youngest sister, Princess Sophia, became heir presumptive to the Kingdom of England and Ireland. Her son became King George I, a direct descendant of our current Queen Elizabeth. Princess Sophia was herself a friend and a prime sponsor of the later philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, another great philosopher of the early modern period. So a very philosophical family all told, and interestingly, they're related to the current King and Queen of England. <laughs> Elizabeth writes to Descartes wanting him to explain something, and she says, Given that the soul of a human being is only a thinking substance, how can it affect the bodily spirits in order to bring about voluntary actions? Ordinarily, she says, movement depends on, first of all, how much it is pushed. We might call that the force. Uh, second of all, the manner in which it is pushed. We might call that something like the direction. Um, and finally, third, the surface texture and the shape of the thing that pushes it. We might call that the surface properties. So, Elizabeth points out that the force and the direction depend on contact, right? Physical contact. That is often the way that we understand causation, although modern day physics gives us some examples of ways in which contact is not required for causal interaction. But Elizabeth is pointing out force and direction depend on contact, 
and surface properties depend on extension. Right, so these are the three types of things that can influence causal effects. But the soul, she says, is not extended by your own definition. It is not essentially extended. And immaterial things, quote, can't possibly touch anything else. So how is it, she's asking, that an essentially unextended thinking thing can causally affect an extended non-thinking thing? How is mind-body causation possible? Give it to me. So hey! Descartes at first seems pretty confident in his response, and he attempts a few different points as part of his response. But as we'll see, Elizabeth has a couple of rejoinders, and it is not clear that Descartes can get out of this puzzle. So his initial response, he makes four points. His first point is, we can't know the mind if we couldn't see it act or feel that it acted on the body. So basically, um, causation must be happening because otherwise we just wouldn't know about the body, right? So uh, when I eat food that's a physical substance, I taste it and that causes an experiential state, a sensation that I grasp mentally. And the concepts that I apply to that sensation are also mental things. So if, if the mind uh, and the body didn't interact, then I wouldn't be able to know either the mind or the body, right? Second of all, he says the union of the mind and body is a basic notion to us. So it's just something that we intuit. We don't really have to think about it. It's kind of a surprise to find out that they're separate. Um, so it's just so basic to us to think that they are united. Thirdly, mental causation is not like physical causation. They, they're supposed to work on a slightly different mechanism, and he acknowledges that. Um, but you don't have to think that they work the same way, mental and physical causation, in order to be able to make sense of how they're distinct. Fourthly, Descartes says that a decent analogy to mind and body causal interaction is the gravitational force. So uh, the weight of a rock acts on it, he thinks, in a similar way to the way that the soul acts on the body. It has influences. And even though uh, gravity is a real force, it doesn't depend on physical contact between two objects. And so he thinks that shows that um, the mind doesn't need to be extended in order to have effects on the body. <laughs> Elizabeth seems like she's, she's, she's being sympathetic, but she rejects the fourth point. She says Descartes' own physics suggests that weight is not a real quality. Perhaps, she says, we are to suppose that weight is an immaterial cause of movement. But again, it seems that what is not material, quote, can't enter into causal relations with matter. She thinks it's easier to deny dualism and attribute matter and extension to the soul than to allow for immaterial causation. It's just harder to understand how something immaterial could cause movement. So hard, in fact, that it might be easier just to think that the soul is material after all, in spite of Descartes' argument in Meditation 6. So Descartes, in his reply this time to Elizabeth, tries to make three additional points. We'll call them five, six, and seven. So point five is, the union of the soul with the body is intuitive. It's a basic everyday assumption. He's basically kind of repeating the second thing that he said in the earlier letter. Um, sixthly, it is impossible to conceive both the soul's distinctness from the body and its union with the body at the same time. So he's telling Elizabeth, look, of course, this is hard to grasp. It's because you're trying to grasp both of these ideas the soul's distinctness from the body on the one hand and its union with the body at the same time. But that's, you can't hold both in your mind simultaneously. You've got to consider them separately. It's not because of the impossibility of, of thinking that they're true together, but just due to the intellectual limits of the human mind. We're just limited beings. And so it's hard to, to carry both things in our mind at the same time. Um, you can already start to smell a little bit of a dubious argument here, right? Because Elizabeth is plenty clever. It's not that she is unable to understand both of these claims. That seems to be what Descartes is suggesting. 
but it's not very fair. That's not a fair way to run a philosophical argument. We are just too intellectually limited to understand the truth of my claim, you know. Seventhly, Descartes says, if we grant that mind is material, there will still be an epistemic problem that leads to dualism. So even if we take your suggestion and uh, like intuit that mind being material is an easier thing to understand than mind-body causation, um, we still have the problem that he is given a pretty good argument, he thinks, for the separability of mind and body, because you can conceive that they're separate. Remember the argument from last time. So he's like, even if you thought mind was material, this would kind of fly in your face. You'd have to make sense of what's wrong with that argument. What you're making is effectively a separate argument that doesn't touch on those points directly. Elizabeth replies, if we can't understand mental causation, mind is not immediately knowable or knowable in a special way, which is what you're saying. And that seems to go against one of the epistemic reasons for dualism that you're giving, right? So if mental causation is just too tough to understand, then how is it that this basic knowledge is so basic? How do we get it in the first place? It feels like the, the reason that you're giving for dualism here, the epistemic reason, it's no ability, just isn't viable anymore. I'm about to end this man's whole career. Done. What career? But I'm not a rapper. We have, therefore, a pretty good argument uh, that Elizabeth is giving against Descartes' substance dualism, and specifically the interactionist substance dualism. She has objections to each of his major claims. His major claim, first of all, that mind and body interact, comes into an issue, which is that it doesn't seem plausible. We don't have a causal principle that we can grasp that explains how mind can affect body. And Descartes' most uh, substantial reply that is just kind of basic. Uh, it's a basic truth of the universe that minds and bodies interact, and we also know it from our early days. That conflicts with something else that he says, which is that the trouble is trying to grasp the union of mind and body at the same time as trying to grasp its distinctness. That's just too hard. There might be a way to spell out Descartes' argument that makes it sound a little bit less suspicious than that, but basically he, he does have a tension in his argument. He needs to work a little bit to, to explain how there isn't a tension in his argument. Because if it turns out that we can't understand mental causation, it's just too difficult to hold in our minds at the same time as separateness, between mind and body, then it means that his first point, that mind is knowable and that it's just sort of a basic truth that they're unified, isn't true um, if we can't understand it. Um, so there's a loop, basically. The, the, the route that Descartes tries to take into his argument um, ends up biting him in the butt, as it were. <laughs> Bada ba boom pow. Oh! Now, can we find a plausible principle that would tell against substance dualism? It's helpful to formulate things in terms of principles when we can. So one possibility, and this is in the Kim reading, and we'll go over this again when we have our unit on mental causation later in the semester after we talk about non-reductive physicalism. Don't worry about that term yet. One possibility is the notion of supervenience. What is supervenience? We can categorize supervenience as a metaphysical relation between two things or two kinds of things. It expresses in its weakest form that the first thing or kind of thing can't vary without a variation in the second. So for example, the market, the economic reality that we live in, like what the stock market is doing supervenes, that is, it depends on and varies at the same time as um, individual stockholders, individual market participants' attitudes about the market. So people's beliefs, which are what we call the realization layer, influence the supervenient layer of the market. So the market is supervenient on the stockholders' beliefs. Does that sort of make sense? There's, there's a dependence there, but it's not necessarily a causal relationship because it, it might be that those two things are actually unified, right? The stock market and the stockholders 
aren't different. They're kind of the same, but they're conceptually separable. We can conceptually separate the idea of the stock market from the idea of the stockholders and investors and their beliefs. But the beliefs, when they change in a way, immediately they affect the way that the market is operating in real time, if that makes sense. There are some caveats here, right? Because the market, like the stock market isn't open seven days a week. There's all this stuff. But the idea is that there's a dependence relation that's not a causal relation. And we call that supervenience. So the claim is that the mental supervenes over the physical. The mental depends on the physical, and that's why it changes when the, the physical changes, even if it's not identical to the physical, the way that the stock market depends on stockholders' behavior and beliefs without that meaning that they are identical to each other. Here's a technical definition of weak mind-body supervenience, and for more on this, you can look into pages 8 to 11 of the Kim reading. The mental supervenes on the physical in that things, such as objects, events, organisms, persons, and so on, that are exactly alike in all physical respects cannot differ with respect to their mental properties. That is, physical indiscernibility entails psychological indiscernibility. Does this require that the mental and the physical interact? That wouldn't necessarily be a causal interaction, it would just be a, a dependence relation of some other kind, a supervenience relation. So supervenience might tell against substance dualism because it would suggest that the, the mental and the physical aren't necessarily distinct. We can conceptually separate them, but they might actually be instantiated by identical substances, in a sense. So some metaphysicians think that substance dualism is the denial of mind-body supervenience, or something like that. But substance dualism can't be merely the denial of mind-body supervenience, probably because many dualists also accept mind-body supervenience. That is, it's a weak enough claim that it can be true while dualism is true. It's just something that, that materialists, that is, people who deny substance dualism, materialists can accept mind-body supervenience without necessarily accepting dualism, right? You don't have to be a dualist about the economy being a different object than the people in the economy. Right? It doesn't have to, you don't need to invent a new substance, the economic substance. Um, you can be a materialist about the economy um, and still accept that the economy supervenes on the behavior of all of the participants of the economy, right? You can accept the supervenience relation because it's a little bit weaker to say that one depends on the other than to say that they are different substances. But supervenience leaves open the possibility that they might be different substances. Dualists instead usually reject something that we might call mind-body dependence. So for more on this, see page 12 in the Kim reading. The mental properties a given thing has depend on and are determined by the physical properties it has. That is, our psychological character is wholly determined by our physical nature. Why do dualists reject this notion of mind-body dependence? Well, dualists think that there are some properties, some mental properties, that don't depend on the physical properties. One example of such a property that some dualists might think um, doesn't depend on physical properties is free will. Right? A lot of dualists classically believed that you know the soul is distinct from the body, and so the soul survives after the body, and so the soul can't depend ex exhaustively on the physical properties. But furthermore, um, the reason that we can make independent choices on that view is that we have a will that is separatable from the physical causes that, that have an influence on the soul or the mind, right? So if everything that I did was physically determined, the worry would be then that there's no room for free will. And so a lot of dualists who like the idea of free will will reject that the mind has 
a dependence, a complete dependence on the body. So they reject mind-body dependence, that principle. One question you might ask yourself is, does mind-body dependence sound plausible? It does seem plausible that maybe the mind does depend for all of its properties on the body. If you're th someone who thinks that the mind is the brain, then you do accept mind-body dependence because you think that everything about the mind totally depends on the way that the brain is. Dualists reject that idea. Um, that's not the only way to think uh, that you can reject mind-body dependence. It's just one example of a way that you can be a non-dualist <laughs> um, and accept dependence. Now, the tricky thing is, if you're a materialist, you have to explain how mind-body dependence is supposed to work. And with that example, that the mind is the brain, that sounds pretty straightforward. But as we'll see, there are some views that might sound tempting and might sound plausible and are really popular on which actually explaining mind-body dependence gets a little bit complicated. And at least according to Kim, that's one reason that we haven't completely solved the mind-body problem yet. So stay tuned, we will talk about that later this semester. I find it a very exciting topic. So Kim's point is that there might be a problem similar to the problem that Elizabeth finds for Descartes' interactionist substance dualism. There's a similar problem, according to Kim, for certain contemporary materialist views, such as, for example, the view that the mind is the software of the brain, which is a view that is very popular um, in cognitive science and computational cognitive science. Not every cognitive scientist believes it, but it is, it is a substantial, very popular view to have. And according to Kim, that view is subject to the same problems or similar problems as Descartes' view of interactionist dualism. So in summary, uh, Elizabeth is finding a different problem for Descartes' interactionist substance dualism than the problem that we had that already came up last time, which is that if something is conceivable, it doesn't necessarily seem like it needs to be possible. That is, one problem with Descartes' argument we saw last time is that it might not be the case that if something is conceivable, then it's possible. Elizabeth finds a problem with the idea that if mind and body are separate substances, then they can interact on Descartes' view. If they're separate substances, Elizabeth just thinks that there's a lot of explaining to do and it's hard to conceive of how something that has no physical extension could affect something that does have physical extension. So what do you think? Do you think we can help Descartes get out of this mess? Do you think he's stuck? Is this the death of substance dualism? Um, is it completely impossible for anyone to hold the view? Stay tuned, you might change your mind later on because it turns out there are other ways to argue for substance dualism. But I'll have fun debating this all with you in class. See you again soon.